The Swan by Raoul Dahl Ernie had been given a point twenty two rifle for his birthday. His father, who was already slouching on the sofa, watching the telly at 9.30 on this Saturday morning, said, Let's see what you can pot, boy. Make yourself useful. Bring us back a rabbit for supper. There's rabbits in that big field the other side of the lake, Ernie said. I seen them. Then go out and nab one, the father said, picking breakfast from between his front teeth with a split matchstick. Go out and nab us a rabbit. I'll get you too, Ernie said. And on the way back, the father said, get me a quart bottle of brown ale. Give me the money then, Ernie said. The father, without taking his eyes from the TV screen, fished in his pocket for a pound note. And don't try pinching the change like you did last time, he said. You'll get a thick ear if you do, birthday or no birthday. Don't worry, Ernie said. And if you want to practice and get your eye in with that gun, the father said, birds is best. See how many spadgers you can knock down, right? Right, Ernie said. There's spadgers all the way up the lane in the edges. Spadgers is easy. If you think spadgers is easy, the father said, go get yourself a Jenny Wren. Jenny Wrens is half the size of spadgers, and they never sit still for one second. Get yourself a Jenny Wren before you start shooting your mouth off about how clever you is. Now, Albert, his wife said, looking up from the sink, that's not nice, shooting little birds in the nesting season. I don't mind rabbits, but little birds in the nesting season is another thing altogether. Shut your mouth, the father said. Nobody's asking your opinion. And listen to me, boy, he said to Ernie. Don't go waving that thing about in the street, because you ain't got no license. Stick it down your trouser leg till you're out in the country, right? Don't worry, Ernie said. He took the gun and the box of bullets and went out to see what he could kill. He was a big lout of a boy, 15 years old this birthday. Like his truck driver father, he had small slitty eyes set very close together near the top of the nose. His mouth was loose, the lips often wet. Brought up in a household where physical violence was an everyday occurrence, he was himself an extremely violent person. Most Saturday afternoons, he and a gang of friends travelled by train or bus to football matches, and if they didn't manage to get into a bloody fight before they returned home, they considered it a wasted day. He took great pleasure in catching small boys after school and twisting their arms behind their backs. Then he would order them to say insulting and filthy things about their own parents. Ow! Please don't, Ernie, please. Say it or I'll twist your arm off. They always said it. Then he would give the arm an extra twist and the victim would go off in tears. Ernie's best friend was called Raymond. He lived four doors away and he too was a big boy for his age. But while Ernie was heavy and loutish, Raymond was tall, slim and muscular. Outside Raymond's house, Ernie put two fingers in his mouth and gave a long, shrill whistle. Raymond came out. Look what I got for me birthday, Ernie said, showing the gun. Cripes, Raymond said. We can have some fun with that. Come on then, Ernie said. We're going up to the big field the other side of the lake to get us a rabbit. The two boys set off. This was a Saturday morning in May, and the countryside was beautiful around the small village where the boys lived. The chestnut trees were in full flower, and the hawthorn was white along the hedges. To reach the big rabbit field, Ernie and Raymond had first to walk down a narrow hedgy lane for half a mile. Then they must cross the railway line and go round the big lake where the wild ducks and moorhens and coots and ring ouzels lived. Beyond the lake, over the hill and down the other side, lay the rabbit field. This was all private land, belonging to Mr Douglas Highton, and the lake itself was a sanctuary for waterfowl. All the way up the lane they took turns with the gun, potting at small birds in the hedges. Ernie got a bullfinch and a hedge sparrow, Raymond got a second bullfinch, a white throat and a yellow hammer. As each bird was killed, they tied it by the legs to a line of string. Raymond never went anywhere without a big ball of string in his jacket pocket and a knife. Now they had five little birds dangling on the line of string. You know something, Raymond said. We can eat these. Don't talk so daft, Ernie said. There's not enough meat on one of those to feed a woodlouse. There is too, Raymond said. The Frenchies eat em, and so do the Itais. Mr Sanders told us about it in class. He said the Frenchies and the Itais 
put up nets and catch them by the million, and then they eat them. All right then, Ernie said, let's see how many we can get. Then we'll take them home and put them in the rabbit stew. As they progressed up the lane, they shot at every little bird they saw. By the time they got to the railway line, they had fourteen small birds dangling on the line of string. Hey, whispered Ernie, pointing with a long arm. Look over there. There was a group of trees and bushes alongside the railway line, and beside one of the bushes stood a small boy. He was looking up into the branches of an old tree through a pair of binoculars. You know who that is? Raymond whispered back. It's that little twerp, Watson. You're right, Ernie whispered. It's Watson, the scum of the earth. Peter Watson was always the enemy. Ernie and Raymond detested him because he was nearly everything that they were not. He had a small, frail body. His face was freckled and he wore spectacles with thick lenses. He was a brilliant pupil, already in the senior class at school, although he was only thirteen. He loved music and played the piano well. He was no good at games. He was quiet and polite. His clothes, although patched and darned, were always clean, and his father did not drive a truck or work in a factory. He worked in the bank. Let's give the little perisher a fright, Ernie whispered. The two bigger boys crept up close to the small boy, who didn't see them because he still had binoculars to his eyes. Hands up, shouted Ernie, pointing the gun. Peter Watson jumped. He lowered the binoculars and stared through his spectacles at the two intruders. Go on, Ernie shouted. Stick em up. I wouldn't point that gun if I were you, Peter Watson said. We're giving the orders round here, Ernie said. So stick em up. Raymond said, unless you want a slug in the guts. Peter Watson stood quite still, holding the binoculars in front of him with both hands. He looked at Raymond, then he looked at Ernie. He was not afraid, but he knew better than to play the fool with these two. He had suffered a good deal from their attentions over the years. What do you want? he asked. I want you to stick em up, Ernie yelled at him. Can't you understand English? Peter Watson didn't move. I'll count to five. Ernie said, and if they're not up by then, you'll get it in the guts. One, two, three. Peter Watson raised his arm slowly above his head. It was the only sensible thing to do. Raymond stepped forward and snatched the binoculars from his hands. What's this? he snapped. What you spying on? Nobody. Don't lie, Watson. Them things is used for spying. I'll bet you were spying on us. That's right, ain't it? Confess it. I certainly wasn't spying on you. Give him a clip over the ear, Ernie said. Teach him not to lie to us. I'll do that in a minute, Raymond said. I'm just working myself up. Peter Watson considered the possibility of trying to escape. All he could do would be to turn and run, and that was pointless. They'd catch him in seconds, and if he shouted for help, there was no one to hear him. All he could do, therefore, was to keep calm and try to talk his way out of the situation. Keep them hands up. Ernie barked, waving the barrel of the gun, gently from side to side, the way he had seen it done by gangsters on the telly. Go on, laddie, reach! Peter did as he was told. So, who was you spying on? Raymond asked. Out with it. I was watching a green woodpecker, Peter said. A what? A male green woodpecker. He was tapping the trunk of that old dead tree, searching for grubs. Where is he? Ernie snapped, raising his gun. I'll have him. No, you won't, Peter said, looking at the string of tiny birds slung over Raymond's shoulder. He flew off the moment you shouted. Woodpeckers are extremely timid. What are you watching him for? Raymond asked suspiciously. What's the point? Don't you have nothing better to do? It's fun watching birds, Peter said. It's a lot more fun than shooting them. Why, you cheeky little bleeder, Ernie cried. So you don't like us shooting birds, eh? Is that what you're saying? I think it's absolutely pointless. You don't like anything we do, isn't that right? Raymond said. Peter didn't answer. Well, let me tell you something, Raymond went on. We don't like anything you do either. Peter's arms were beginning to ache. He decided to take a risk. Slowly he lowered them to his sides. Up, yelled Ernie. Get em up. What if I refuse? Blimey, you got a ruddy nerve, ain't you? Ernie said. I'm telling you, for the last time, if you don't stick em up, I'll pull the trigger. That would be a criminal act, Peter said. It would be a case for the police. And you'd be a case for the hospital, Ernie said. Go ahead and shoot, Peter said. 
Then they'll send you to Borstal. That's prison. He saw Ernie hesitate. You're really asking for it, ain't you? Raymond said. I'm simply asking to be left alone, Peter said. I haven't done you any harm. You're a stuck-up little squirt, Ernie said. That's exactly what you are, a stuck-up little squirt. Raymond leaned over and whispered something in Ernie's ear. Ernie listened intently. Then he slapped his thigh and said, I like it. It's a great idea. Ernie placed his gun on the ground and advanced upon the small boy. He grabbed him and threw him to the ground. Raymond took the roll of string from his pocket and cut off a length of it. Together, they forced the boy's arms in front of him and tied his wrists together tight. Now the legs, Raymond said. Peter struggled and received the punch in the stomach. That winded him and he lay still. Next, they tied his ankles together with more string. He was now trussed up like a chicken and completely helpless. Ernie picked up his gun and then, with his other hand, he grabbed one of Peter's arms. Raymond grabbed the other arm and together they began to drag the boy over the grass towards the railway lines. Peter kept absolutely quiet. Whatever it was they were up to, talking to them wasn't going to help matters. They dragged their victim down the embankment and onto the railway lines themselves. Then one took the arms and the other the feet, and they lifted him up and laid him down again, lengthwise, right between two lines. You're mad, Peter said. You can't do this. Who says we can't? This is just a little lesson we're teaching you not to be cheeky. More string, Ernie said. Raymond produced the ball of string and the two larger boys now proceeded to tie the victim down in such a way that he couldn't wriggle away from between the rails. They did this by looping string around each of his arms and then threading the string under the rails on either side. They did the same with his middle body and his ankles. When they had finished, Peter Watson was strung down, helpless and virtually immobile between the rails. The only parts of his body he could move to any extent were his head and feet. Ernie and Raymond stepped back to survey their handiwork. We've done a nice job, Ernie said. There's trains every half hour on this line, Raymond said. We ain't going to have long to wait. This is murder, cried the small boy lying between the rails. No, it ain't, Raymond told him. It ain't anything of the sort. Let me go, please let me go. I'll be killed if a train comes along. If you are killed, sonny boy, Ernie said, it'll be your own ruddy fault and I'll tell you why. Because if you lift your head up like you're doing now, then you've had it, chum. You keep down flat and you might just possibly get away with it. On the other hand, you might not because I ain't exactly sure how much clearance them trains have got underneath. You happen to know, Raymond, how much clearance them trains got underneath? Very little, Raymond said. They're built ever so close to the ground. Might be enough and it might not, Ernie said. Let's put it this way, Raymond said. It'll probably just about be enough for an ordinary person like me or you, Ernie. But Mr. Watson here, I'm not so sure about. And I'll tell you why. Tell me, Ernie said, egging him on. Mr. Watson here's got an extra big head, that's why. He's so flipping big-headed, I personally think the bottom bit of the train's going to scrape him, whatever happens. I'm not saying it's going to take his head off, mind you. In fact, I'm pretty sure it ain't going to do that. But it's going to give his face a good old scraping over. You can be quite sure of that. I think you're right, Ernie said. It don't do, Raymond said, to have a great big swollen head full of brains if you're lying on the railway line with a train coming towards you. That's right, ain't it, Ernie? That's right, Ernie said. The two bigger boys climbed back up the embankment and sat on the grass behind some bushes. Ernie produced a pack of cigarettes and they both lit up. Peter Watson, lying helpless between the rails, realised now that they were not going to release him. These were dangerous, crazy boys. They lived for the moment and never considered the consequences. I must try to keep calm and think, Peter told himself. He lay there quite still, weighing his chances. His chances were good. The highest part of his head was his nose. He estimated the end of his nose was sticking up about four inches above the rails. Was that too much? He wasn't quite sure what clearance these modern diesels had above the ground. It certainly wasn't very much. The back of his head was resting upon loose gravel in between two sleepers. He must try to burrow down a little into the gravel. So he began to wriggle his head from side to side, pushing the gravel away and gradually making for himself a small indentation, a hole in the gravel. 
In the end, he reckoned he had lowered his head an extra two inches. That would do for the head. But what about the feet? They were sticking up too. He took care of that by swinging the two tied-together feet over to one side so they lay almost flat. He waited for the train to come. Would the driver see him? It was very unlikely, for this was the main line. London, Doncaster, York, Newcastle and Scotland, and they used huge long engines in which the drivers sat in the cab way back and kept an eye open only for the signals. Along this stretch of the track, trains travelled around 80 miles an hour. Peter knew that. He had sat on the bank many times watching them. When he was younger, he used to keep a record of their numbers in a little book, and sometimes the engines had names written on their sides in gold letters. Either way, he told himself, it was going to be a terrifying business. The noise would be deafening, and the swish of the 80-mile-an-hour wind wouldn't be much fun either. He wondered for a moment whether there would be any kind of vacuum created underneath the train as it rushed over him, sucking him upward. There might well be. So whatever happened, he must concentrate everything upon pressing his entire body against the ground. Don't go limp. Keep stiff and tense and press down into the ground. How you doing, rat face? One of them called out to him from the bushes above. What's it like waiting for the execution? He decided not to answer. He watched the blue sky above his head where a single cumulus cloud was drifting slowly from left to right. And to keep his mind off the thing that was going to happen soon, he played a game that his father had taught him long ago on a hot summer's day when they were lying on their backs in the grass above the cliffs at Beachy Head. The game was to look for strange faces in the folds and shadows and billows of a cumulus cloud. If you looked hard enough, his father had said, you would always find a face of some sort up there. Peter let his eyes travel slowly over the cloud. In one place he found a one-eyed man with a beard. In another there was a long-chinned laughing witch. An aeroplane came across the cloud travelling from east to west. It was a small high-winged monoplane with a red fuselage. An old piper cup, he thought it was. He watched it until it disappeared. And then, quite suddenly, he heard a curious little vibrating sound coming from the rails on either side of him. It was very soft, this sound, scarcely audible, a tiny little humming, thrumming whisper that seemed to be coming along the rails from far away. That's a train, he told himself. The vibrating along the rails grew louder, then louder still. He raised his head and looked down the long and absolutely straight railway line that stretched away for a mile or more into the distance. It was then that he saw the train. At first it was only a speck, a faraway black dot, but in those few seconds that he kept his head raised, the dot grew bigger and bigger and it began to take shape, and soon it was no longer a dot, but the big, square, blunt front end of a diesel express. Peter dropped his head and pressed it down hard into the small hole he had dug for it in the gravel. He swung his feet over to one side. He shut his eyes and tried to sink his body into the ground. The train came over him like an explosion. It was as though a gun had gone off in his head, and with the explosion came a tearing, screaming wind that was like a hurricane blowing down his nostrils and into his lungs. The noise was shattering. The wind choked him. He felt as if he were being eaten alive and swallowed up in the belly of a screaming, murderous monster. And then it was over. The train had gone. Peter opened his eyes and saw the blue sky and the big white cloud still drifting overhead. It was all over now, and he had done it. He had survived. It missed him, said a voice. What a pity, said another voice. He glanced sideways and saw the two large louts standing over him. Cut him loose, Ernie said. Raymond cut the strings, binding him to the rails on either side. Undo his feet too, so he can walk, but keep his hands tied, Ernie said. Raymond cut the strings around his ankles. Get up, Ernie said. Peter got to his feet. You're still a prisoner, matey, Ernie said. What about them rabbits? Raymond asked. I thought we was going to try for a few rabbits. Plenty of time for that, Ernie answered. I just thought we'd push the little bleeder into the lake on the way. Good, Raymond said. Cool him down. You've had your fun, Peter Watson said. Why don't you let me go? Because you're a prisoner, Ernie said. And you ain't just no ordinary prisoner neither. You're a spy. And you know what happens to spies when they get caught, don't you? 
they get put up against the wall and shot. Peter didn't say any more after that. There was no point at all in provoking those two. The less he said to them and the less he resisted them, the more chance he would have of escaping injury. He had no doubt whatsoever that in their present mood they were capable of doing him quite serious bodily harm. He knew for a fact that Ernie had once broken little Wally Simpson's arm after school and Wally's parents had gone to the police. He had also heard Raymond boasting about what he called put in the booting at the football matches they went to. This, he understood, meant kicking someone in the face or body when he was lying on the ground. They were hooligans, these two, and from what Peter read in his father's newspaper nearly every day, they were not by any means on their own. It seemed the whole country was full of hooligans. They wrecked the interiors of trains, they fought pitched battles in the streets with knives and bicycle chains and metal clubs, they attacked pedestrians, especially other young boys walking alone, and they smashed up roadside calves. Ernie and Raymond, though perhaps not quite yet fully qualified hooligans, were most definitely on their way. Therefore, Peter told himself, he must continue to be passive. Do not insult them, do not aggravate them in any way, and above all, do not try to take them on physically. Then, hopefully, in the end, they might become bored with this nasty little game and go off to shoot rabbits. The two larger boys had each taken hold of one of Peter's arms and they were marching him across the next field towards the lake. The prisoner's wrists were still tied together in front of him. Ernie carried the gun in his spare hand. Raymond carried the binoculars he had taken from Peter. They came to the lake. The lake was beautiful on this golden May morning. It was a long and fairly narrow lake with tall willow trees growing here and there along its banks. In the middle the water was clear and clean but nearer to the land there was a forest of reeds and bulrushes. Ernie and Raymond marched their prisoner to the edge of the lake, and there they stopped. Now then, Ernie said, what I suggest is this. You take his arms, and I take his legs, and we'll swing the little perisher one, two, three, as far out as we can into them nice muddy reeds. How's that? I like it, Raymond said, and leave his hands tied together, right? Right, Ernie said. As that with you, snot nose? If that's what you're going to do, I can't very well stop you, Peter said, trying to keep his voice cool and calm. Just you try and stop us, Ernie said, grinning, and then see what happens to you. One last question, Peter said. Did you ever take on somebody your own size? The moment he said it, he knew he had made a mistake. He saw the flush coming to Ernie's cheeks, and there was a dangerous little spark dancing in his small black eyes. Luckily, at that very moment, Raymond saved the situation. Hey, look at that bird swimming in the reeds over there, he shouted, pointing. Let's have him. It was a mallard drake with a curvy spoon-shaped yellow beak and a head of emerald green with a white ring round its neck. Now those you really can eat, Raymond went on. It's a wild duck. I'll have him, Ernie cried. He let go of the prisoner's arm and lifted the gun to his shoulder. This is a bird sanctuary. Peter said. A what? Ernie asked, lowering the gun. Nobody shoots birds here. It's strictly forbidden. Who says it's forbidden? The owner, Mr. Douglas Highton. You must be joking, Ernie said, and he raised the gun again. He fired. The duck crumpled into the water. Go get him, Ernie said to Peter. Cut his hands free, Raymond, because then he can be our flipping gun dog and fetch the birds after we shoot them. Raymond took out his knife and cut the string binding the small boy's wrists. Go on, Ernie snapped. Go get him. The killing of the beautiful duck had disturbed Peter very much. I refuse, he said. Ernie hit him across the face hard with his open hand. Peter didn't fall down, but a small trickle of blood began running out of one nostril. You dirty little perisher, Ernie said. You just try refusing me one more time and I'm going to make you a promise. And the promise is this, you refuse me just one more time and I'm going to knock every single one of them shiny white front teeth out of yours, top and bottom. You understand that? Peter said nothing. Answer me, Ernie barked. Do you understand that? Yes, Peter said quietly. I understand. Get on with it then, Ernie shouted. Peter walked down the bank into the muddy water, through the reeds and picked up the duck. He brought it back and Raymond took it from him and tied string around its legs. 
Now we got a retriever dog with us. Let's see if we can't get us a few more of them ducks, Ernie said. He strolled along the bank, gun in hand, searching the reeds. Suddenly he stopped. He crouched. He put a finger to his lips and said, Shh! Raymond went over to join him. Peter stood a few yards away, his trousers covered in mud up to the knees. Look it in there, Ernie whispered, pointing into a dense patch of bulrushes. Do you see what I see? Holy cats, cried Raymond. What a beauty! Peter, peering from a little further away into the rushes, saw at once what they were looking at. It was a swan, a magnificent white swan, sitting serenely upon her nest. The nest itself was a huge pile of reeds and rushes that rose up about two feet above the waterline, and upon the top of all this the swan was sitting like a great white lady of the lake. Her head was turned towards the boys on the bank, alert and watchful. "'How about that?' Ernie said. "'That's better than ducks, ain't it?' "'You think you can get her?' Raymond said. "'Of course I can get her. I'll drill her hole right through her noggin.' Peter felt a wild rage beginning to build up inside him. He walked up to the two bigger boys. I wouldn't shoot that swan if I were you, he said, trying to keep his voice calm. Swans are the most protected birds in England. And what's that got to do with it? Ernie asked him, sneering. And I'll tell you something else, Peter went on, throwing all caution away. Nobody shoots a bird sitting on its nest. Absolutely nobody. She may even have signets under her. You just can't do it. Who says we can't? Raymond asked, sneering. Mr. Bleeding Snotty Nose Peter Watson? Is that the one who says it? The whole country says it, Peter answered. The law says it, and the police say it, and everyone says it. I don't say it, Ernie said, raising his gun. Don't, screamed Peter. Please don't. Crack! The gun went off. The bullet hit the swan right in the middle of her elegant head, and the long white neck collapsed onto the side of the nest. Got her, cried Ernie. Hot shot, shouted Raymond. Ernie turned to Peter, who was standing small and white-faced and absolutely rigid. Now go get her, he ordered. Once again, Peter didn't move. Ernie came up close to the smaller boy and bent down and stuck his face right up to Peter's. I'm telling you, for the last time, he said, soft and dangerous. Go get her. Tears were running down Peter's face as he went slowly down the bank and entered the water. He waded out to the dead swan and picked it up tenderly with both hands. Underneath it were two tiny signets, their bodies covered with yellow down. They were huddling together in the centre of the nest. Any eggs? Ernie shouted from the bank. No, Peter answered, nothing. There was a chance, he felt, that when the male swan returned, it would continue to feed the young ones on its own if they were left in the nest. He certainly did not want to leave them to the tender mercies of Ernie and Raymond. Peter carried the dead swan back to the edge of the lake. He placed it on the ground. Then he stood up and faced the two others. His eyes, still wet with tears, were blazing with fury. That was a filthy thing to do, he shouted. It was a stupid, pointless act of vandalism. You're a couple of ignorant idiots. It's you who ought to be dead instead of the swan. You're not fit to be alive. He stood there, as tall as he could stand, splendid in his fury, facing the two taller boys and not caring any longer what they did to him. Ernie didn't hit him this time. He seemed just a tiny bit taken aback at first by this outburst, but he quickly recovered, and now his loose lips formed themselves into a sly, wet smirk, and his small, close-together eyes began to glint in a most malicious manner. So you like swans, is that right? he asked softly. I like swans and I hate you, Peter cried. Am I right in thinking, Ernie went on, still smirking, am I absolutely right in thinking that you wish this old swan down here were alive instead of dead? That's a stupid question, Peter shouted. He needs a clip over the ear hole, Raymond said. Wait, Ernie said, I'm doing this exercise. He turned back to Peter. So, if I could make this swan come alive and go flying round the sky all over again, then you'd be happy, right? That's another stupid question, Peter cried out. Who do you think you are? I tell you I am, Ernie said. 
I'm a magic man, that's who I am. And just to make you happy and contented, I'm about to do a magic trick that'll make this dead swan come alive and go flying all over the sky once again. Rubbish, Peter said. I'm going. He turned and started to walk away. Grab him, Ernie said. Raymond grabbed him. Leave me alone, Peter cried out. Raymond slapped him on the cheek, hard. Now, now, he said. Don't fight with auntie, not unless you want to get hurt. Give me your knife, Ernie said, holding out his hand. Raymond gave him his knife. Ernie knelt down beside the dead swan and stretched out one of its enormous wings. Watch this, he said. What's the big idea? Raymond asked. Wait and see, Ernie said. And now, using the knife, he proceeded to sever the great white wing from the swan's body. There is a joint in the bone where the wing meets the side of the bird, and Ernie located this and slid the knife into the joint and cut through the tendon. The knife was very sharp and it cut well, and soon the wing came away all in one piece. Ernie turned the swan over and severed the other wing. String, he said, holding out his hand to Raymond. Raymond, who was grasping Peter by the arm, was watching fascinated. Where do you learn how to butcher up a bird like that? he asked. With chickens, Ernie said. We used to nick chickens from up at Stephen's farm and cut them up into chicken parts and flog them to a shop in Aylesbury. Give me the string. Raymond gave him the ball of string. Ernie cut off six pieces, each about a yard long. There are a series of strong bones running along the top edge of a swan's wing, and Ernie took one of the wings and started tying one end of the bits of string all the way along the top edge of the great wing. When he had done this, he lifted the wing with the six string ends dangling from it and said to Peter, Stick out your arm. You're absolutely mad, the smaller boy shouted. You're demented. Make him stick it out, Ernie said to Raymond. Raymond held up a clenched fist in front of Peter's face and dabbed it gently against his nose. You see this, he said. Well, I'm going to smash you right in the kisser with it unless you do exactly as you told, see? Now stick out your arm. There's a good little boy. Peter felt his resistance collapsing. He couldn't hold out against these people any longer. For a few seconds he stared at Ernie. Ernie, with the tiny, closed-together black eyes, gave the impression he would be capable of doing just about anything if he got really angry. Ernie, Peter felt at that moment, might quite easily kill a person if he were to lose his temper. Ernie, the dangerous backward child, was playing games now, and it would be very unwise to spoil his fun. Peter held out an arm. Ernie then proceeded to tie the six string ends one by one to Peter's arm, and when he had finished, the white wing of the swan was securely attached along the entire length of the arm itself. How's that, eh? Ernie said, stepping back and surveying his work. Now the other one, Raymond said, catching on to what Ernie was doing. You can't expect him to go flying round the sky with only one wing, can you? Second wing coming up, Ernie said. He knelt down again and tied six more lengths of string to the top bones of the second wing. Then he stood up again. Let's have the other arm, he said. Peter, feeling sick and ridiculous, held out his other arm. Ernie strapped the wing tightly along the length of it. Now, Ernie cried, clapping his hands and dancing a little jig on the grass. Now we got ourselves a real live swan all over again. Didn't I tell you I was a magic man? Didn't I tell you I was going to do a magic trick and make this dead swan come alive and go flying all over the sky? Didn't I tell you that? Peter stood there in the sunshine beside the lake on this beautiful May morning, the enormous, limp and slightly bloodied wings dangling grotesquely at his sides. Have you finished? he said. Swans don't talk, Ernie said. Keep your flipping beak shut and save your energy, laddie because you're going to need all the strength and energy you got when it comes to flying round in the sky. Ernie picked up his gun from the ground, then he grabbed Peter by the back of the neck with his free hand and said, March! They marched along the bank of the lake until they came to a tall and graceful willow tree. There they halted. The tree was a weeping willow, and the long branches hung down from a great height and almost touched the surface of the lake. And now the magic swan is going to show us a bit of magic flying, Ernie announced. 
So what you're going to do, Mr. Swan, is to climb up to the very top of this tree and when you get there you're going to spread out your wings like a clever little swanny swan swan and you're going to take off. Fantastic, cried Raymond. Terrific, I like it very much. So do I, Ernie said, because now we're going to find out just exactly how clever this little swanny swan swan really is. He's terribly clever at school, we all know that. And he's topped the class and everything else that's lovely. But let's see just exactly how clever he is when he's at the top of the tree. Right, Mr. Swan? He gave Peter a push towards the tree. How much further could this madness go, Peter wondered. He was beginning to feel a little mad himself, as though nothing was real anymore and none of it was actually happening. But the thought of being high up in the tree and out of reach of these hooligans at last was something that appealed to him greatly. When he was up there, he could stay up there. He doubted very much if they would bother to come up after him, and even if they did, he could surely climb away from them along a thin limb that would not take the weight of two people. The tree was a fairly easy one to climb, with several low branches to give him a start up. He began climbing. The huge white wings dangling from his arms kept getting in the way, but it didn't matter. What mattered now to Peter was that every inch upward was another inch away from his tormentors below. He had never been a great one for tree climbing, and he wasn't especially good at it. But nothing in the world was going to stop him from getting to the top of this one, and once he was there, he thought it unlikely they would even be able to see him because of the leaves. Higher! shouted Ernie's voice. Keep going! Peter kept going and eventually he arrived at a point where it was impossible to go higher. His feet were now standing on a branch that was about as thick as a person's wrist, and this particular branch reached far out over the lake and then curved gracefully downward. All the branches above him were very thin and whippy, but the one he was holding onto with his hands was quite strong enough for the purpose. He stood there resting after the climb. He looked down for the first time. He was very high up, at least fifty feet, but he couldn't see the two boys. They were no longer standing at the base of the tree. Was it possible they had gone away at last? All right, Mr. Swan, came the dreaded voice of Ernie. Now listen carefully. The two of them had walked some distance away from the tree to a point where they had a clear view of the small boy at the top. Looking down at them now, Peter realised how very sparse and slender the leaves of a willow tree were. They gave him almost no cover at all. Listen carefully, Mr. Swan, the voice was shouting. Start walking out along that branch you're standing on. Keep going till you're right over the nice muddy water, then take off. Peter didn't move. He was fifty feet above them now, and they weren't ever going to reach him again. From down below there was a long silence. It lasted maybe half a minute. He kept his eyes on the two distant figures in the field. They were standing quite still, looking up at him. All right then, Mr. Swan, came Ernie's voice again. I'm going to count to ten, right? And if you ain't spread them wings and flown away by then, I'm going to shoot you down instead with this little gun. And that'll make two swans I've knocked off today instead of one. So here we go, Mr. Swan. One, two, three, four, five, six. Peter remained still. Nothing would make him move from now on. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Peter saw the gun coming up to the shoulder. It was pointing straight at him. Then he heard the crack of the rifle and the zip of the bullet as it whistled past his head. It was a frightening thing, but he still didn't move. He could see Ernie loading the gun with another bullet. Last chance, yelled Ernie. The next one's going to get you. Peter stayed put. He waited. He watched the boy who was standing among the buttercups in the meadow far below with the other boy beside him. The gun came up once again to the shoulder. This time he heard the crack. At the same instant the bullet hit him in the thigh. There was no pain, but the force of it was devastating. It was as though someone had whacked him on the leg with a sledgehammer and it knocked both feet off the branch that he was standing on. He scrabbled with his hands to hang on. The small branch he was holding onto bent over and split. Some people, when they have taken too much and have been driven beyond the point of endurance, simply crumble and give up. There are others, though they are not many, who will for some reason always be unconquerable. 
You meet them in time of war and also in time of peace. They have an indomitable spirit and nothing, neither pain nor torture nor threat of death, will cause them to give up. Little Peter Watson was one of these, and as he fought and scrabbled to prevent himself from falling out of the top of that tree, it came to him suddenly that he was going to win. He looked up and he saw a light shining over the waters of the lake that was of such brilliance and beauty he was unable to look away from it. The light was beckoning him, drawing him on, and he dived towards the light and spread his wings. Three different people reported seeing a great white swan circling over the village that morning. A school teacher called Emily Mead, a man who was replacing some tiles on the roof of the chemist's shop, whose name was William Isles, and a boy called John Underwood, who was flying his model aeroplane in a nearby field. And that morning, Mrs. Watson, who was washing up some dishes in her kitchen sink, happened to glance up through the window at the exact moment when something huge and white came flopping down onto the lawn in her back garden. She rushed outside. She went down on her knees beside the small crumpled figure of her only son. Oh, my darling, she cried near to hysterics and hardly believing what she saw. My darling boy, what happened to you? My leg hurts, Peter said, opening his eyes. Then he fainted. It's bleeding, she cried, and she picked him up and carried him inside. Quickly she phoned for the doctor and the ambulance, and while she was waiting for help to come, she fetched a pair of scissors and began cutting the string that held the two great wings of the swan to her son's arms. The End